Good evening, everyone. So our next talk is about to start, so I'll read it off for you. The title one is Counter Histories, How Reinterpreting the Past Can Change the Future. Um, so I'll read a little bit about it as well, too. What makes historical events rise above the ordinary mundane cycles of life into the categories of significance? In this talk, Cash will delve into the origins and consequences of foreign interventions in Iran's politics, the ways that they shaped the country and the people, and the breakout of the Iranian Revolution in 1979. He will lay out his views on the reasons for his development and the ways in which his personality of, he was personally affected by the mentalities, ideas, and behaviors of his family. Family. Um, how do we as individuals develop ourselves in the midst of a larger than life event? How do we survive the traumas of a cataclysmic war and geopolitical destructions? Finally, what is the future in this new Iranian revolution that is unfolding and can, in, and can it reckon with the forces of the Old West and the New East? And I'll read the bio off of Kaj. Kaj go. Kash Gobadi um, is the director and lead developer of Unto Mitzlan, Unto Infinity. Kash is an experienced game developer with expertise in Unity, AR, and VR, and a jack of all trades in his approach to game design. He is currently working as a programmer and co-producer of the Glory Society, Nights, uh, Nights in the Woods. His other works, such as Stereophotic and Oceanorama, have been featured in international festivals and museums around the world. He is also the founding member of Big... Damn, you did a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is good, though. He is also the founding member of Big Bag, a collective of game makers and artists based in Brooklyn, whoop, whoop, um, creators of titles such as Terminal 69 and The Course. Please welcome with a round of applause, Cash, OK? <laughs> Hi, everyone. So I'm Cass Kabadi. Um, thanks for coming to my talk, and thanks for coming to Amaze and supporting all our work here. I also want to thank all the people running the festival. They've done a really good job. Um, thank Silent Green as well for hosting us. Um, so today we'll be talking about counter history, um, and in particular, a retelling of the modern history of politics in Iran uh, from my own perspective. Uh, so who am I, right? Who am I to tell this story? Um, well, I'm a game developer from the US, member of Big Bag, as they all said. Um, and member of the Glory Society who made Night in the Woods. I'm an Iranian-American, um, or an American-Iranian in some ways. Uh, I grew up in, Amer in America uh, after the revolution. Uh, my parents came here, uh, you know, in the, in the 70s, so. Um, and I'm also the creator of Onto Land, which is here uh, showing nearby the open screens up there, which you can go check out. Um, I'm also a history understander in constant training, uh, as we all should be, I think. And I'm a Marxist thinker and revolutionary organizer. Um, I will make a disclaimer. I'm not a professional historian. For me, this is both a personal uh, fascination and a passion, and it's also part of my identity. So uh, being a professional revolutionary in, in its own way is also something I strive to be. Uh, and most thinkers in that tradition are not professional historians, um, as we think of them today. Um, so what is on Tamaziland? What is this game that I brought here? Uh, Onto Maze Land is a game about humankind's suicidal instincts and in interweaving grand geopolitical destruction with personal tragedy. Um, it's really a game that unfolds as this kind of nightmarish nightmare scenario uh, where you start an apartment in Tehran um, and it quickly descends into the trauma of the Iranian Revolution uh, and transforms into this nuclear apocalypse scenario uh, that didn't really happen. Uh, and it, it does conclude with the suicide of my uncle Ramin. Um, it's a game about coping with this kind of tragedy uh, that feels more or less unimaginable uh, in proportion and actually trying to confront the feelings that they create rather than run or hide. Uh, it's also a game about a particular person at this particular point in history and my own family. Um, you can watch my talk from uh, GDC online. It's, it's free to watch on YouTube. It's called Out War with Reality. Um, and the rest of the talks from that experimental gameplay workshop uh, are really good. Uh, it goes more into my relationship with Ramin, so if you're more interested in just this personal side, that's where you can see more about that. Uh, and this is a picture of the game. So it's, uh, this is like the living room where you kind of spend a lot of the time in the early part of the game. Um, so what exactly is history? I'll, I'll just give a, a, my own definition. Um, 
It's a process where perceptions, memories, and recordings of reality intersect, overlap, and conflict in order to arrive at a clearer, fuller picture uh, of the past. Uh, it combines this personal experiences that we all have with the broadest magnitude of um, you know, political, social, racial, geographic experience. Um, it's really a collective experience in that sense. Uh, it can be viewed from all sorts of different perspectives um, based on these different lenses. Uh, and some of them can be a bit more scientific than others. Um, so here's just, you know, we can see it moves from this sort of personal to this world level, right? Um, so what's a counter history? A counter history goes against the mainstream trends and interpretations, usually with a critical perspective that reorients the way we view things. <laughs> so what is Marxism? Uh, what is its history? Uh, for, for the most part, Marxism really is this methodology and critical perspective of reality. It's not necessarily a finite set of conclusions about things, but uh, guiding views and principles for how you can approach things in politics and history and economics and all sorts of aspects of life. Uh, what are the guiding views, right? Um, there tends to be this sort of linear story a lot of Marxists tell about uh, human history being guided by class conflict, um, where society passes through these different stages, going back from tribal society through feudalism, capitalism, uh, to eventually going to socialism and communism. Uh, Marx synthesized this by combining his theoretical and historical works with revolutionary activism and organizing, but Marxism is much broader than simply Marx. Um, you know, the tradition was carried on by many other revolutionaries. We had a talk from someone from Yugoslavia before many people in Eastern Europe understand this from a very different perspective than people in the United States, uh, which makes sense. Um, so, and, you know, after, after the Russian Revolution, this kind of thinking explodes onto the world scene. Uh, they set up what's called the Communist International, and all sorts of other parties are set up in other countries. Uh, after World War II, Marxist parties took power in many other countries, including China and Eastern Europe, right? Uh, opening up this sort of Cold War between capitalism and communism, where, of course, you know, Marx's predictions about things didn't play out exactly as people expected. Instead of Europe having these revolutions, uh, it was mostly countries that were, A, either formally colonized or, you know, in different parts of the world than what he was looking at. Um, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, at the end of the Cold War, supposedly, uh, basically we also see a collapse of the world communist movement um, and a period of what some may call uh, counter-revolution. Um, but really, it did this Cold War end, right? So let's actually talk about Iran. Um, obviously, the history of Iran goes back really deep into the past um, with a long line of kings called Shahs stretching back thousands of years. Um, it's an ancient culture and geographically significant place. You can see up there on the world map that Iran really is right in between Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, it's connected to bodies of water on both sides as well. Um, it currently has a population of about 88 million. Um, this is a breakdown of all the ethnic groups that are in Iran. Uh, there is a majority of Persians. It's the, ma the main ethnicity, um, but there's a lot of other minority groups there, um, other groups which have traveled there over time and refugees from the past 30, 40 years as well from Afghanistan, Syria, other places. Um, so yes, historically it's run by monarchy, but it also has this strong Islamic Shia clergy tradition as the majority religion. Um, if you don't know what the difference between uh, Shia and Sunni style Islam, Shia Shiism is really focused on these historically important Islamic clergy. So they are like priests basically that have ties back to historically important figures in Islam, especially the Prophet. Um, in Iran, this is incredibly important. So this is a big timeline I've constructed. Um, I spent a lot of time on this, but we're basically going to go through a lot of these events on the top half and then see how it ties to the bottom half. The bottom half is sort of where my family exists in relation to all of this, um, generationally speaking, uh, for all the people who are still alive and not alive too. Um, and then the top half is these major events that we'll kind of go through to get a broad look at all of this. Um, I know it might seem a little overwhelming, we'll come back to it. So the first event I'm gonna talk about here is the Constitutional Revolution. This is a turn of the century uh, revolution in Iran that actually a lot of young Iranians have no idea about. No, I've, I've talked to a lot of people. Uh, for some reason, this is not taught, um, and people don't seem to remember it either because it was long enough ago. Back in 1905 is when it started. Um, so 
I began with this because it really signals the start of Iran's modern political development. Here you have all the core elements of the Iranian Revolution of 1979. You have mostly the same revolutionary classes. Um, you have this alliance of merchants from the bazaars who are like, they run the markets in Iran, very important people. Um, the Shia clergy, as I mentioned earlier, and radical intelligentsia, which is like, you know, um, educated class people who come together, have new ideas, want to bring ideas from the West, um, and create a democracy in Iran. Iran at this point is run by the Qajar dynasty. It's a dynasty that's been around for a long time. People know it's really corrupt. Um, and they're supported by foreign empires. Um, at this point, they aren't their own empire, right? The, the glory days of the Persian Empire are gone, long gone. And so what we see is a major pattern emerges here. You can see on the right, this is the uh, initial first parliament meeting, basically, the, the Majlis, which was established by this revolution. But throughout this period, um, the feudal lords, basically, the, the Qajar family, continued to fight with these people. Uh, and to do so, they had to rely on either A, the British Empire, or the Russian Empire. On one side, you had the Western Empire, and on the other, the Eastern Empire. So this is a pattern we'll see, is that the British and the Russians are just completely fighting over Iran. So skipping forward a bit. Um, and, and basically, in 1920, you know, this is now after the Russian Revolution, the Communist Party of Persia forms um, and starts to begin activities mostly in northern Iran. Uh, we'll come back to that. Reza Pahlavi is here. This is a military man from the north of Iran. He basically fought in World War I, otherwise was not royalty. Um, but he's from Mazandaran province, which is where my family is from. And he takes power in what is essentially a coup supported by the British, also against the Qajar family, uh, who had all but, their rule had all but collapsed on its own. So in 20, 1925, he takes over. And he really sets about modernizing the country in Iran. Um, he builds a secular form of government uh, and excludes the Shia clergy, essentially, from this government, um, which creates this sort of rift now between these forces in Iran, where previously they were sort of somewhat integrated into the feudal system, um, but obviously saw a lot of radical potential from them. Uh, he's a known fan of fascism, um, and so in 1941, his rule comes to an end uh, as a joint envision of the British and the Soviets uh, comes and comes from both sides in Iran. Uh, the Soviets come down from the north, and the British come from the west. Um, and so they, they actually make him step down. They, make, they decide, the Allies decide, that his son, Mohammad Reza Shah, uh, would be the new uh, leader. And of course, he's a you know, European, basically educated guy. Um, they exile this guy. He's gone. And um, there's his son. So both of these people, you'll, you'll find in my game, they're uh, important figures in the game, uh, and also important reasons for why the revolution happens. Um, you know, meanwhile, also, this is 1941, my grandparents are both born in Mazandaran, where they're from. Uh, and many of these men in the north uh, are influenced by the Soviets. Uh, and they create what's called Hezbo Tude, a party of the masses in Iran. So they make this like revamped communist party and start work for a revolution. Um, there's also a lot of nationalists in Iran at this time. Um, uh, my grandpa at this point is like 10 years old, uh, and he joins this party, the Communist Party. Um, and at this time, Iranians are really pushing for a democratic Iran and an end to feudalism and dynastic rule. So this is Mohammad Mossadegh. He's a very famous politician from Iran's history. Um, he actually was related to the Qajar dynasty. A lot of politicians were. Um, and basically, all the democratic forces at this time start to consolidate around Mossadegh. A lot of these people are people who remember the Constitutional Revolution. They remember what was kind of denied to them by both foreign powers and the feudal lords. Um, and so a, a major, major part of all of this is the oil in Iran. Um, why are these countries intervening? Well, they want basically access, unlimited access, unfettered access to Iranian oil. Uh, and they, you know, basically the British are the, the owners of this company. So Mossadegh comes in, and he's been promising for years, you know, I'm going to nationalize the oil. Um, he basically pursues all these radical policies of land reform, uh, social welfare, and wealth distribution, which already should be enough to get him kicked out. Um, but the nationalization of the Anglo-Persian oil company causes a complete panic in the West uh, for shareholders and for of course, the British Empire, which is still powerful at this time. Um, this alone 
pretty much sentences his administration to doom, but also you'd be surprised to see that many people in his own party um, started to abandon him uh, and many other figures around him as well as the Islamic clergy turned against him. Um, so British initiate a coup basically. Uh, the Americans become heavily involved uh, as it's the, after World War II and they're the dominant power now. They, uh, there's public documents showing just how extensively the CIA was involved in all of this. Uh, they organized the coup basically as the primary leadership of it uh, and put back in power the Shah. So um, you can play this great game called The Cat and the Coup actually. It's, it's a short free game um, and it covers this period of history uh, very well. Um, the art's really beautiful as well. You play as a cat while all of this kind of happens. Um, so yeah, Mossadegh spends the rest of his life in basically in prison and uh, has no real effect on political outcomes anymore. So we're gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, Shaw's back in power, great. Uh, he goes on modernizing Iran and uh, basically swiftly developing it, um, you know, bringing in all these other help from these capitalist powers, right? Um, he's understandably starting to, the, the people see him as a foreign you know, puppet, right? They, they see him as very much so put in place by the British and the Americans. Um, and you know, basically at this time, the, the Communist Party is completely repressed. The Shah is extremely anti-communist and most, most nationalist forces are as well. Um, and at this time, what this does is ultimately all the major communist thinkers split. So they begin to form other groups. Um, and throughout the next period, as the Shah is kind of reforming the country in what's called the White Revolution, um, these organizations all form uh, to counter the Shah and to build a revolutionary movement that will bring an end to feudalism. At the same time, the Shah is hoping to also bring an end to feudalism somehow. Uh, not the sense that he would step down, but in the sense that he would change the country enough that he could retain power. So some of these organizations, and they create this broad movement, right? It's a mix of um, this united front between all the, basically the same underlying components we talked about earlier, uh, the Bazari merchants, the radical intelligentsia, student movements, and the Islamic clergy. Um, so you have groups like People's Mujahideen of Iran, which are some of, many of my family members were part of at one point. Um, which has changed a lot. Uh, organization of Iranian People's uh, Fedayeen, which is like the majority party of socialists, um, Freedom Movement of Iran, and all these groups that start to follow, in particular, uh, the Islamic clergy, surrounded by um, a, a particular leader named Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, this is this very broad movement, right, where you have these left-leaning communists and anti-imperialists mixed with nationalists at this point, mixed with socialists, um, and basically these people who are combining Islam and socialism. Uh, and then on the other side you have the Islamic theologians, right? Um, and really within the first year of this revolution, um, there's these major protest movements organized by all of these different groups. Um, there's also guerrilla warfare going on against the Shah. And the Shah is really not prepared to handle this. He doesn't have equipment to put down these protests uh, in a nonviolent manner. And so we have this event called Black Friday where there's a massive killing spree by the, the military um, and that really triggers the rest of this revolution. And within this first year of the revolution, we see all of this is consolidated under Khomeini. Um, the followers of him create this revolutionary organization called the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which still exists today and I will talk about it quite a bit more. Um, yeah, I'm gonna show some pictures here. This is major, major protests happening. Um, you'll see like a lot of uh, them carrying these pictures of Khomeini, who was like exiled at the time. Um, these are like some of the militant people, uh, all really armed to the teeth. Um, when the revolution really took over, those people basically stormed all the buildings and, and took over all the, par uh, all the parliament buildings, all these like government buildings. There's more signs of Khomeini. This is Khomeini coming back to Iran uh, after the revolution. Um, the French, uh, he, he stayed in Paris for a while and the French sent him back. Um, and this is him like giving a big speech when he arrives. You can play a really, really intricate game about this. It was mentioned in the Mexican uh, 1921 talk, um, but it's a very inspirational game. It goes quite in depth with the revolution. Um, you'll see a lot of it 
as it breaks out um, and from all these different perspectives. Uh, it's really the paramount game for the revolution. And I think, um, you know, when I started making Onto Land, I knew I, I wouldn't be making a game that was a sort of accurate historical depiction because this game already exists. Um, so we're going to fast forward a bit also to what happens after this revolution. Um, so the new government comes in, and it's this mix of old government officials with new revolutionary leaders. Um, essentially, the, the major, major thing that happens between Iran and the US at the beginning of this year is that the student movement decides to occupy the US embassy, uh, where there's about 80 people still at this time, and takes them hostage, uh, all the di diplomats that are there. So. Uh, this wasn't planned by the revolutionary leadership. Uh, Khomeini actually found out about it like a couple hours after it happened. And he was like, at, at first somebody had convinced him that they should stop it. And then other people came to him, uh, other imams came to him who were, gave approval to this. And it became like actual policy. And I think in this, he saw this opportunity to very rapidly take and consolidate power. Um, because what happens is, as this is going on, all the old moderate people leave the government. They enter opposition groups or they flee the country. Um, even people he had brought in directly himself, people that Khomeini had worked with for years. Um, so this just kind of sets the stage for calamity, right? Uh, in the mix of all this chaos, Saddam Hussein, leader of Iraq at the time, and the Ba'athist party, which is a minority Sunni party and opposed to Iran, um, comes, you know, and basically, starts a war with, with the uh, Iranians. He invades Iran and uh, hoping to reclaim territory. And this is supported by the United States and the Western countries. Um, every basically attempt the Iranians made to have a UN resolution uh, passed over this to have someone actually recognize what was going on or recognize the use of chemical weapons was more or less denied for years. Um, the Iranians used lots of uh, child soldiers in this war up to like 600,000 people died on their side, um, and about 500,000 people might have died for the Iraqis. Um, about more than 100,000 civilian deaths as well. So the numbers were really staggering. Um, and you know, meanwhile, um, as this war is continuing for nearly a decade, uh, the Islamic Revolution is really consolidating all the power that it can. Um, everything is being turned into this you know, mythicized version of what, what the revolution actually was, right? The, as we saw, the revolution was like a very broad uh, ideological thing. Uh, it didn't have one exact trend, but it all becomes consolidated at this point. And through this process of the war, I think, people become just extremely, obviously, traumatized. Um, this creates also this big rift between uh, Iranians who left before the revolution and Iranians who stayed um, and had to endure all of this. Um, not everybody did, and uh, it's, it's a very dark episode that actually nobody really talked about in my family. I'd never heard about it until I was an adult. Um, so meanwhile, also, just to point out, Israel goes to war in Lebanon, and this begins this process where Iran is now at war with basically lots of different people in the region. Uh, they start funding these paramilitary groups and proxies. So uh, this does come to an end eventually. Um, they are forced, essentially, to take a peace agreement after they push the war forward for another four years. Khomeini could have made peace around 1984, but kept it going. I think it was politically difficult to end it because, you know, the rhetoric around the war was that fighting was, like, a very good thing. Dying a martyr for the revolution would be, like, a, a beautiful thing to do. Um, but, of course, that's not what the experience was. So the Islamic government at this point also, at the end of the war, executes massive, massive numbers of the political prisoners they had since the revolution. Um, many of the leaders of the revolution from the socialist and left-leaning groups are just straight up executed. Uh, at this point, you know, this is really the consolidation of all of this. It's, it's, it's really over for any of the other groups. Um, and also, the IRGC, the organization I talked about before, is now just deeply embedded in the whole society. Um, all, now that all the opposition forces are kind of gone, and we basically see that the next year after this, uh, 1999, Khomeini passes away. Um, instead of there really being a power struggle, it, it very clearly he has a successor who's a new Ayatollah. 
Uh, they're the supreme leaders, right? But really the glove of this kind of dictatorship they create for themselves is this IRGC organization. It's thoroughly ideologically aligned with them. And it controls all these other offshoots, right? So all the, all the other groups that you hear about that are fighting in other countries based, that are funded by Iran are taught and trained by these guys. Um, they also are the, the basic bedrock of all the internal police forces in Iran that suppress the people. Um, and of course, the Islamic government throughout all of this paints the opposition with this broad brush as people who would, you know, uh, endanger the revolution and whatnot. Um, and they do successfully guarantee hatred against a lot of these groups. Um, one of the groups I mentioned earlier, the People's Mujahideen, actually the, the leaders of that group fled to Iraq during the war and fought on the other side. Um, so Iranians have never forgiven them for, for obvious reasons, but um, there's like almost just this lack of also remembrance now about what the fact that the socialist revolution existed um, as alongside this other revolution. So really this era of counter-revolutionary um, nihilism begins in Iran where uh, for a long time there's just kind of these spontaneous protests. There's no real major organizations that are able to stick around and, and lead all of this. Although some of them do stick around, they're, they're constantly repressed, right? Um, so it's not really until 2009 that major protests erupt in response to this claim of a rigged election um, that we start to see manifest political forces emerging in Iran again uh, as, as organized forces. Um, and you know, this is all tied up with world politics as well, right? Uh, in the late 2000s, you know, in the United States we had the Occupy movement. All of this is tied also to the contractions of the markets, um, which are especially difficult for Iran being under many, many sanctions since the hostage crisis. Um, but you know, people in Iran don't necessarily see it as, as just being about sanctions. They see it as this government essentially has no economic theory. The, the government didn't deliver on any of the things the revolution was really about besides stopping the West, uh, which it, arguably they didn't. <laughs> so contemporary Iran, right? Um, since 2009, things in Iran have really only seemed to get worse economically and politically from the outside. Um, major feminist movements have kind of erupted in support of Iranian women internationally uh, as they were not really subjected to the kinds of laws of the Islamic government before with the Shahs. The Shahs were secular. And if you look at photos from that period, you'll see, you know, um, women dressed very uh, casually. Um, and so more recently, right, we have all these sort of basically distinctions appearing um, between the, the groups that have risen up in support of the, the death of Masa Amini, who's a very important person now in Iran. Um, she died in 1922 in police custody. Um, but, you know, when the, all the articles were coming out about that, uh, there hadn't yet been some kind of investigation or actually evidence that emerged that the Islamic government killed her. Um, I have yet to see it, but also I, I fully believe, based on what they've done, that they, they would have killed her. Um, I don't think it really matters regardless because people, people saw it as this sort of symbolic moment. Um, it's, in, in a lot of ways, they've, the Iranians I've talked to have compared it to like the, the death of George Floyd and the, the eruption of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. Um, uh, so this is a photo of her. It's gone around quite, quite a lot. Um, you've probably also heard women, life, freedom. That's, that's the sort of saying from this, this new revolution that goes around everywhere. Um, this is some photos of major protests going on. Um, okay, so what is, what is the point of all this, right? Why, why talk about all of this? Um, ultimately, this presentation is really about Iran's experience at critical turning points of a lack of sovereignty, uh, where decision-making was denied to the majority of people, not just by their own government, but by foreign forces. It's important to understand history also in order to understand the present. Um, you know, if we're going to think about supporting whatever's going on in Iran now or any other country, we also have to be careful about how and why we do that. Um, as you can see from the 1979 revolution, having a lot of good ideas doesn't necessarily mean a revolution turns out or is successful. So we have to ask, um, how did this current political system and economic system develop? You know, what internal and external forces exist that support and reject these things? Um, you know, what classes of people would benefit from a revolution? Uh, 
is it really possible for those people to bring it about? <clears throat> All these th things together also have direct and indirect effects on the development of individual human beings, families, and entire people, right? Um, and we have to think that all countries, places, and people have these intricate complexities and patterns that can only be understood and acted on deeply after critical study. In that sense, no actors on the world stage should feel that they have a unilateral ability to intervene in other countries. Um, what this is really about is that we need to see an end to that kind of intervention. So let's return to this timeline, right? Um, we've actually been through everything on the top. Uh, now. Let's look at the bottom, right? Um, so you'll see we actually covered all of that. Uh, for those of you who've played onto Maisieland or seen my previous talk, it'll make some sense. Um, but let's just say that my, for my family, Rami and my uncle represented this kind of linkage between old Iran and new life in America. You can see there that he was born on the eve of the revolution. Uh, he actually believed himself to be an accident and was yet this deeply loving and connected person. Um, his parents' death was this ma major tragedy for my family and for him as well. Uh, he was actually only 10 years old when this happened, but looking at the timeline, this would have been quite a common experience for Iranians at that time, uh, although most of those deaths would have been from traumas during the war. Um, he's really lucky that he survived the accident and lucky that he did not have to serve in that war, but at the same time, uh, he was just caught in the maelstrom of this revolution, ultimately, and suddenly without parents. Um, my grandparents were extremely close to his parents, so they took him in, but he never really recovered from this, right? Um, like the youngest son and actually daughter of the Shah, uh, Rami committed suicide shortly after the turn of the century. It was a really common outcome, I think, in a lot of Iranian families, uh, being disconnected from their land and from their home. Uh, and also the families being fractured, for that matter. So for me, Aunt uh is not just a project, but it's a fundamental part of who I am. Uh, it, working on it sort of changed my life in that sense. Um, games, when they can be used as a personal form of expression, really, are this deeply impactful medium because I do believe that they're particularly good at allowing people to experience these alternate perspectives, both of history and of uh, reality in general. Um, you know, I, I really don't think it's, it's surprising that the, the most prominent games in, from Iran are these games about these critical turning points in the history um, and these moments of just incredible angst and frustration for Iranians. Um, you know, the, rev the revolution is living memory for most people in Iran, um, or, you know, from Iran that you'll meet other, in other countries. Uh, most people have parents that live through it or grandparents. Um, the intervention against Mossadegh, for example, is really remembered by also all of our elders and almost unilaterally and universally seen as a major upset in our history. Um, games are this ideological battlefield as well, right? Everything that we do ha and consume has some level of a lens and an ideology and a perspective on all, all sorts of events. Um, and really all of this information should serve to not only propel the game forward, but to also propel forward like there is this new era that we are entering where we can also, as a international community, think about these things differently. You know, we shouldn't just keep repeating these cycles, but um, think about how we can somehow get out of them or create a new system that allows for a truly international and de democratic uh, system. Um, this is a, a picture of the game as well from the ending. So this is just conclusion, right? Um, basically, humans are all tied up in their history, right? We, we can't really escape it. We, we have to face our history and acknowledge what happened. And if we become disconnected from it and our place of birth and our culture, we may become also mentally unwell. Um, we, we have to try to reinvent ourselves wherever we go, even if we don't have control over where we end up, right? We have to somehow fit into this dominant culture, even if we're in a place that's foreign to us. Um, for, for me and for, I think, a lot of people, games and art are now this way for us as individuals and as a collective to reinterpret our pasts and also uh, become connected again to our past and our culture. Um, they allow us also to reestablish a sense of history. Um, you know, these, the idea of alternate history allows us to explore these other outcomes, but ultimately they're also disconnected from reality, right? Um, and in that sense, 
a, well, a lot of what happens in my game is about while it explores an alternate history, it has to re reappear and confront this reality of what actually happened both to Iran and to my family. Um, in that sense, we have to really confront reality with critical thought in order to be able to change it. Um, if you want to learn more about this stuff, there's plenty of books you can read um, and films as well. So here's just some books. All the Shah's Men is about the Mossadegh period. Um, the Destruction of Iran is sort of about mostly the revolution and aftermath of it. Um, the Mantle of the Prophet is really focused on Khomeini and the development of his ideas and how he took power. Um, Iran in the West is a really good documentary about all of the, the, the revolution and uh, aftermath um, and the Iran-Iraq war as well. And then this is just, again, the, the two games I talked about, uh, 1979 revolution and uh, the cat in the coup. Uh, I just want to thank you for, for sitting through my, my historical uh, lecture. Uh, and I, I really did want to give this talk because this is just what it's like to talk to me, to be honest. Um, if, if you ask me about my game, I'll talk to you for like sh straight 30 minutes about history. So uh, that's how I approach games right now. And I think it's how I approach basically politics as well. Um, you can follow my work uh, on Twitter at The Static Man. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for coming. Give it up for Cash. Yes, give it up for Cash. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for letting us into such an intimate video game and a very, very comprehensive history lesson. Thank you. Um, we'll have five minutes for questions. Does anyone have questions for Cash? Right here in the orange on the left. Thank you for the talk. Uh, it was it was so good. I was sitting and I was on verge of tears all the time. Um, but I wanted to ask about. Uh, it sounds like the game is very like, filled with history and whatnot. And I ask want to ask if you've worked with like historians or whatnot or playtesters or consulted right. to make sure that the history of it all is still kind of intact. Yeah. So I I actually didn't do that because what I was trying to do with the the game itself, if if you play the game, the game is more of an emotional reinterpreting of all of this. It's less like sort of what this presentation is, which is more what I've actually researched and also from a lot of conversation with my family members. Right. So the history that does exist in the game is also this personal history more more than anything else, um, and kind of the. I think the emotional remembrance of these different things, um, I would not consider myself like pro Shah or anything. A lot of people in the United States are like supportive of putting the Shah's only son left back into power um, as like a democratic leader or something. They call themselves like constitutional monarchists. Like pe people have a very emotional way of relating to these things. Um, and I think there's like now this, you know, looking back at things, there's a nostalgia for what was before that, right? Um, no, I would love to work with more historians, but this has been a completely personal project. And I think um, what you'll see in the game is more like what it feels like to experience the history than it is the accurate, like a completely accurate portrayal of it. Um, and I would say, though, that uh, that's also been my experience talking to people in my family. Even my grandfather, who's very well read and knows quite a lot about all of these things and experienced a lot of it, you know, his memory is not as good anymore. And I think for him also, uh, Ramin was like a son to him, and I think when he died, he it was a couple of years after that I didn't, you know, really talk to him about these things in depth. So the the level of his memory about a lot of this was, I think, kind of not where it would have been if I had talked to him earlier, right? Um, but I think there's still something kind of crucially important about all that. Like I think um, the actual experience people have of history is sometimes much more important than what really happened to most people, right? So, yeah. Any more questions? Um, I'll ask one, just for like the last one as well too. Since I dealt with counter narratives from like black perspectives in films, you do it with video games. And I think the democratizing of history is like an important thing or taking history away from like historians and giving it to the people is an important thing. Can you say this, that what you did in this game, you took history away from historians and gave it to like the everyday people? And is that like empowering in a way? Yeah, I think it, that, that is kind of an interesting way of looking at it. And I think, um, I mean, for me it was like, yeah, like this 
also emotional connection to just this family member that was gone. And I think that reclaiming that and sort of seeing him as part of this history is a sort of people's history, right? It's like um, everyone basically lost somebody like Ramin in this event, uh, whether it was like a brother or a son or a father, right? Or a, a mother or a daughter or any of these people. Many people died in this event. Um, it's, there's also just uh, obviously this long history of a struggle, right, to basically reclaim Iran as an uh, independent power. And again, we have this, <laughs> this, this, this narrative of women, life, freedom, right? It's, it's very open-ended. And I think one thing I've been trying to do is also just get other Iranians who, to not just react to what's happening, but to like critically think about all the things that have led up to it and why we're in that position we are. So that, you know, because I, I do think that if you simply just bring an end to a regime, it doesn't guarantee anything good is going to happen afterwards. We could have something much worse. Um, we could have a new war. We could have uh, any kind of catastrophe. It's on, you don't know what will happen. And I think having new organizations out of the people is the only way that we can guarantee something will work. We have to believe in the people of Iran and the people anywhere that the world can improve and get better. Um, but you also have to you know, diligently bring that about. It can't be simply like, we just want this, so hopefully it'll happen, right? Um, yeah. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Please give a round of applause for him one more time.